I've often wondered, uh, you know, uh, what makes a foreign country foreign? In particular, you travel all this distance and you uh, come here. And uh, the easy answer is uh, distance. But uh, I, it, I don't think that's a complete answer. In all honesty, today is India is actually closer to North America, America and Canada, than it is to Pakistan. Uh, if you had to actually look, ask an Indian, particularly its middle class, I mean, to be fair, that, uh, you know, in real terms, who is the neighbor of India? I think most people would actually, I may mean, not reach it, but say America or Canada rather than Pakistan, because we've become so completely distant from Pakistan. Uh, the reasons for this, of course, uh, uh, lie. Let's actually begin our uh, try uh, examination of a very difficult subject, complex subject, and I hope uh, I don't fall into the trap of, as I say, being judgmental. Uh, by I mean, I'm sure that all of us have met Pakistanis and all of us have met Indians. Um, and you come to this extraordinarily startling conclusion that there is no difference between Indians and Pakistanis. And there isn't. We are the same people. So why, over six decades, have the two nations diverged along such different paths? India has its share of faults. I mean, God knows it has. Uh, and those that God doesn't know about, we as journalists tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, why still, why does India seem as if it is evolving towards a horizon? And why does Pakistan seem as if it is sinking into a stagnant swamp? Uh, the reason lies not in the character of the Indian and the Pakistani. The reason is, and this is one of the themes of my book, that the idea of India is stronger than the Indian, and the idea of Pakistan is weaker than the Pakistan. Now, having sort of said this dramatic thing, I have to now go around and explain what do I mean by this. What is the idea of Pakistan? Pakistan was built, was created, around a notion which has absolutely no relevance and no past. It was built around an idea that a religion could be sufficient as the basis of nationalism. And more specifically, that Islam could be sufficient, was sufficient as a basis for nationalism. Now, I will not actually bore you into the many reasons why the founders of Pakistan, in particular Jinnah, who was one of the persons I admire, actually, greatly. I mean, if you, the Jinnah was a genuine hero in the mold, that uh, not least because of a sin, he, of a common weakness he shared with Joe and me. <laughs> 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 but when Jinnah, you know, I mean, he was a kind of character. He, who, uh, after he ate his dinners, and those of you who know British law, know that if you really want to be a successful barrister in the British system, all you have to do is eat dinner. <laughs> at Lincoln's Inn. But even seriously, after he had eaten his dinners, he still actually wanted to be uh, play Romeo at Old Vic. He wanted to be a Shakespearean actor. And till his di last days, till his last days, when he was, whenever he felt low, and you know, those who lived, uh, there's one of the things that I learned while I was researching the book, is not to be censorious about this generation. Because they were living at a time when the future was completely in a fog. You know, today we, it's easy for us to understand what democracy is all about. We've had six decades of experience. But in the 1930s, who knew what this animal democracy would become? Europe was producing Hitler out of democracy. It was producing Mussolini out of democracy. These were their contemporaries, mind you. This is what the news they were reading, that you know, this is what the vote had produced. So who knew? What, these, uh, what this strange democracy as we know it today did not exist. The, in France, the women, the women did not have the vote till 49. And so on and so forth. 
So nobody really, so you can't really go around blaming X or blaming Y for it, but except try and understand. So uh, how did he, and he had repeatedly warned against mixing religion and politics. In fact, he held it against Gandhi, that Gandhi was doing this quite often in his career. So how did this person reach a point where he actually thought? Very interestingly, the clerics, the theologians of Islam, you know, when you think, uh, particularly look at the world of Islam and uh, from the West, from Canada or from America or from Britain, for a variety of reasons, the first and you know, most substantive image that comes to your mind is, the, is of the Arab. But the Arab constitutes only 20-25% of the world of Muslims. The largest in the British Raj, the British Empire, used to actually taunt the Khalif, taunt uh, the Turks, and saying, how are you calling yourself the Khalifa uh, or the Khalif? You see, because the largest number of Muslims in the world lived in, under the British Empire and the British Raj of India, between Afghanistan and Burma. And that really, till today, if you add up the populations, is the largest uh, constituency of Muslims in the world as one broadly ethnic group. So, it, and the intellectual centers of Islam were also in India, among them being Deoband. In fact, it was the Imams of Deoband who stood up against Jinnah and said that where in the history of Islam have you discovered this notion that uh, you know, uh, religion is, can be the basis of nationalism? Islam is a brotherhood, it is not a nationhood. Within uh, a few years, within two or three years of the death of the Prophet, peace be upon him, you know, the, the Muslims were split politically between Shia and Sunni. And that was a conflict till today, which has nothing to do with religion, by the way. It has nothing to do with the basic tenets of the faith. It is a battle for power. And who shall succeed the prophet as the imam or as the leader of the people? All I'm trying to say is that there is no record, no basis. As Maulana Azad pointed out very effectively, he says, well, if you know, religion was sufficient as the basis of nationalism, why would there be 22 Arab countries? They have religion in common, they have language in common. Language is actually a far more relevant basis for nationalism. Whole of Europe is, after all, has been created on the basis of linguistic nationalism. So, this argument was there, but alas, in, this, in, the, in, the, you know, in 1937, actually, the argument for Pakistan began, I think, on a rational basis. As a search for the security of Muslims in a post-British dispensation, which is perfectly rational. Every minority has a right to worry about its future. So there was nothing. But when you ask that question and raise those issues, then there can always be constitutional answers to such a question. That means you don't have to divide the nation in order to find the answer. But in 1937, particularly in Punjab, when Jinnah lost the argument, because in the first election that was held in 37, the Muslim League could not get even two seats out of the 80 in Punjab. And if it could not survive in, you know, among, as a factor among the Muslims of Punjab in, with separate electorate, separate electorate means that only Muslims could vote for Muslims. If the Muslim League could not survive in Punjab, where on earth could it survive? Now comes a very relevant question, which I'm sure all of you, since you all belong to the ruling class, <laughs> must have experienced in your own lifetimes. What does a lawyer do when he loses the case? <laughs> he changes the story. And that is what Jinnah did. After 37, he shifted the story and picked up a strand from the public you know, discourse of the times shifted the story from the security of Muslims, that means the, the danger to Muslims, and shifted to Islam in danger. And when he changed the narrative, and Pakistan was created not for Muslims, but for Islam, and that became the basis of the concept that Pakistan was created as a fortress of the faith. Pakistan is the first nation to have been created for a faith, 
rather than for the people.